Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This is The Way. This will be my full Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 3 video. There are a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references. They also brought back a bunch of characters that we haven't seen since Season 2. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. And careful for spoilers for the episode if you haven't seen it yet. We'll start at the beginning, work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs, WTF moments, and what's really going on. Because there are a couple cliffhangers at the end of the episode, a couple big twists. But I think they were pretty obvious in the way that they were setting things up and explaining why characters were doing what they were doing. Especially the shady comms officer. Very shady. The title of the episode was Chapter 19, The Convert, which is meant to be a reference to a couple different characters. A reference to Bo-Katan, because now she's a believer, she bathed in the living waters and became part of Mando's covert under the armor. It was a reference to Dr. Pershing, now we know his real name is Dr. Penn Pershing, and to the former comms officer, Alia Kane, who seems like she may have switched sides, but I think that's a ruse. I think she's just playing a long con, and she's secretly trying to break Moff Gideon out of prison. We'll get to that part of the episode, because she was playing four-dimensional chess with Dr. Purging. Basically, the theme of the episode, though, is that people are switching sides, so to speak. Switching sides in conflicts, like Mandalorian faction versus Mandalorian faction, the Armors faction versus Bo-Katan's faction. She has now switched sides. Now Dr. Purging and all these other Imperial characters that were working under Moff Gideon seem like they've switched sides to the New Republic, but at least one of them we know of is probably lying through her teeth. I'm not sure when they did this, it might have just been for The Mandalorian Season 3, but they added Bo-Katan's Night Owl's Mandalorian helmet to the intro. I think that's why they removed Kylo Ren's helmet, like they're just swapping helmets in and out based on the series. Katie Sackhoff also talked about this too. She said that after they used her character in Season 2, she didn't expect to come back and be as big a character in live action in future Mandalorian season as she is now. She actually thought it was just going to be like a one-off cameo scene, but it turned into a much bigger thing and now she's like one of the main characters. She's a great actress, and it's a really interesting character that it'll be fun to learn more about. If you did not watch the Clone Wars episodes, they really get into a lot of her character during Clone Wars, but you're really just scratching the surface. You learn a little bit about her relationship with Duchess Satine, her sister, and the other mystery third sister. We'll talk about that later in the episode, too. There is like a mystery third sister that they never fully explained during the Clone Wars. But the episode begins with Bo-Katan just stunned silent thinking about the mythosaur and what just happened, what it means about their ancient traditions, the creed, all their beliefs. It's all true. She's starting to believe again and she becomes a convert, so to speak. Bo-Katan witnesses for Mando, and later in the episode too, attesting to the other Mandalorians that he did bathe in the living waters and has been redeemed. He is officially a Mandalorian again, but he didn't see the Mythosaur, or so he claims. And I think he's being honest, like he was genuinely passed out, and Bo-Katan was the only one that saw the Mythosaur. She also claims the reason why he fell so deep into that larger cave is because of the bombings that happened during the Great Purge. Originally, the cave that held the living waters was meant to be relatively shallow, but the bombings just opened up the larger cavern where the Mythosaur's lair had probably been for all these years. Mando grabs a vial of the living waters as proof for the armor. Also, we find out that the armor had some secret living water stash with her because during episode one, it makes the same reaction when she pours it into her forge. Even though they take off and Bo-Katan makes no mention of the Mythosaur, I think this is meant to be a big cliffhanger for this particular moment. They will come back and eventually get the Mythosaur to help them or get like a baby Mythosaur. At some point, there will be more Mythosaur riding, like they did the Rancor with Boba Fett during the Book of Boba Fett. They obviously plan to have Mando, Bo-Katan, maybe Grogu also riding a Mythosaur during the Mandalorian series at some point. You also notice that when they're leaving Mandalore, the way that Bo-Katan treats Mando has completely changed. Like, the whole vibe is different. She's way nicer to him, way more pleasant just in general. She invites him for a feast, but jokes that he wouldn't take his helmet off and it'd be pointless. When Grogu reacts by gurgling in this really upset-sounding noise, it's him being upset that they're not staying for an actual feast. Like, he wants an actual feast. Like, come on, let's stay. <laughs> Maybe at some point they'll pay that moment off where they share a feast together and he winds up eating a ton of food. It's like the Pedro Pascal meme from The Last of Us where he's just having a panic attack thinking about where his next pog soup is going to come from. When is Bo-Katan going to make me some more soup? When they go back to Kalevala, they get attacked by a squadron of TIE interceptors that we saw in all the trailers. Grogu closes his pod just for protection like he did during Season 2. Mando jumps out with his jetpack, gets into his Naboo starfighter, and they team up, like Bo-Katan Mando team up to take them all out pretty easily too, like he says, no scratches. Bo-Katan also jokes with R5 about being an old pro navigating the seaside cliffs on Kalevala, which is meant to be the same vibe as Luke Skywalker referencing bullseyeing womp rats with his T-16 back in Beggar's Canyon when he went on the Death Star trench run, like, ah, uh, it's not gonna be any problem at all, no big deal. 
Don't worry. I grew up flying these cliffs. And of course, it's been a while. But it's not impossible. I used to bullseye womp rats in my T-16 back home. They're not much bigger than two meters. Then we see a squad of Thai bombers destroy Bo-Katan's family's ancestral palace, destroying most of it, which is meant to be a reference back to the Great Purge where you saw the Thai bombers destroy the planet's surface. It's meant to give her a bit of a PTSD flashback to that. When she calls them mud scuffers, that's just meant to be a random Star Wars insult that was used by Cara Dune in previous seasons too. They're gonna have to publish a Star Wars urban dictionary at some point. There's so many slang terms, so many curse words. A bunch more squadrons of TIE Interceptors wind up showing up to chase them away. So a lot of people wondering about this too. Where did they come from? Because the interesting thing about the TIE Fighters, I mean they're TIE Interceptors, but all these different types of TIE Fighters do not have hyperdrives, which is why they're able to get away, why they can jump to hyperspace to escape. Meaning that the short range fighters, meaning that the ship that they came from, the Imperial ship, was somewhere in the Mandalorian system, somewhere nearby. I think these TIE Interceptors, the TIE Bombers, the other TIE Fighters are part of Moff Gideon's former forces and Grand Admiral Thrawn's 7th Fleet, which we got a teaser for during Mandalorian Season 2. Like I just did a Thrawn video, the whole idea is that his 7th Fleet has returned from the Unknown Regions and it's way bigger than the amount of forces that Moff Gideon had access to before he was captured at the end of Mandalorian Season 2. The other reason why I don't think these are Moff Gideon's forces and they belong to Thrawn is because when Moff Gideon was captured at the end of Mandalorian Season 2, they took his capital ship and all the other lesser ships, the TIE fighters that he had with him. So while these Imperial ships would have to belong to someone else, and that someone else is probably Grand Admiral Thrawn. The reason why he'd order the TIE bombers to destroy her palace is because he's trying to sideline her so that she can't rally more Mandalorians to challenge the Empire, or the remnants of the Empire. It's all part of Grand Admiral Thrawn's master plan to sideline any potential threats to him defeating the New Republic, and the Mandalorians would represent a huge threat to him. So that's why he would want Bo-Katan out of the way. Then the episode jumps back to Coruscant and covers more of the Imperial side of the story after the end of Season 2. We didn't really get a lot of these characters during the Book of Boba Fett, so I think this is the first big time that we checked in with their characters in a while. You also remember that we were just on Coruscant during the Andor series, but this is meant to be many years later. According to Jon Favreau, during The Mandalorian Season 3, we're about nine years after Return of the Jedi. So during the episode, they reference how the New Republic has basically replaced all the Imperial insignia all over the place, and they're slowly mothballing all this old Imperial technology. But generally, Coruscant is meant to look almost the exact same. Dr. Pershing is giving a speech to a bunch of New Republic senators and really powerful people from the galaxy that live on Coruscant. So it's basically like all the same people came back to Coruscant like, okay, we're all still senators from our planets. It's the same as it was before, just no Empire, New Republic banners everywhere now. And the speech he's giving is all about reformation, like I'm really sorry about all the terrible things that I did, but the Empire perverted my work. I'm all about the advancement of science. The same kind of speech you get from all misguided scientists. Like I only care about the pursuit of knowledge, even though it's kind of a morally murky gray area. He confirms what we all believed after the Mandalorian season went into the first couple of episodes. We guessed that he was working on cloning research because the insignia on his jacket was the same as the Kamino cloning facility during the prequels. He claims Moff Gideon misused his cloning research to secure more power for himself. He also is kind of talking about the Emperor too because he would have been around during the original trilogy working under the Empire doing the same thing. The whole idea is that the Emperor wanted to clone himself and that's all about this Mount Tantus project that they're teasing on Bad Batch right now. He was working for that group of people because the uniforms that they're wearing were the exact same type of uniform that Pershing was wearing in the first couple of seasons. Meaning that Dr. Pershing probably worked at Mount Tantus and it's another heir to the Empire Easter egg. I've been talking about how they're doing a live action version of Heir to the Empire with Grand Admiral Thrawn coming to the show and them changing a couple of the characters like the cloning plot with Luke Skywalker during Heir to the Empire is now the Grogu cloning plot. But during this speech, Dr. Pershing confirms a lot of our theories in earlier seasons. Especially when he starts talking about the idea of taking the different superior attributes of different test subjects to combine them to make something even better. That's all about Moff Gideon and Grand Admiral Thrawn's plan, their grand plan to create force sensitive clone troopers. It would essentially give them a nigh invincible army. But the idea now is that he's trying to win over the New Republic Senate and these other powerful people in the New Republic so they won't throw him in prison and they'll let him continue his research, which they claim is very illegal under New Republic law in Coruscant. You also notice the nervous tick that he has there. I don't know if he's always had that or if he just recently developed it, but anytime he starts to get really upset, he starts grabbing his ear. 
You see him do it again later in the episode when the rehabilitation droid starts asking him the same questions like, are you upset with the New Republic? And he starts grabbing his ear like, yeah, I'm starting to get a little upset. When he talks about his backstory during the episode too, like during this scene when he references his mother dying and how cloning could have saved her, I think that's all meant to be genuine. Even later in the episode when the comms officer starts honeypotting him, trying to get him arrested on purpose, when he's talking to her about his mother and his childhood growing up dreaming of a lab like this, it's all meant to be very naive and genuine. Like he doesn't care about empire or new republic, he just wants to advance science for the betterment of the human race. And the tragedy of that, as in all stories like this, is that his work will be perverted by more powerful people. Mostly in Thrawn and Moff Gideon trying to create force sensitive troopers. The other funny Easter egg here too, some of you may have picked up on this vibe, is that the area that they're in here where the speech is being given is meant to be the same place where Palpatine had the infamous meme worthy speech with Anakin Skywalker. That's more of a callback to the idea that Palpatine was trying to find a way to clone himself and that's what he was using this technology for. When he was talking to Anakin Skywalker about finding the secret to cheat death, turns out he was just talking about cloning. When Dr. Pershing references the first cast rejecting his formula, that's a reference to the failed test subjects back on Navarro that we saw during season two. And the whole conversation he has with this group of senators is meant to feel kind of slimy. Like they were people that Mon Mothma was talking about during the Andor series that really only cared about preserving their own power, profiting off of their positions. And they make it sound like they're interested in his cloning technology so that they can preserve their own lives like Palpatine was trying to do, like so that they can stay in power forever. So the whole idea here and later in the episode is they want to make the New Republic feel like it's not that different in a bad way too. Like it's just as shady as things were under the Empire. For the most part, maybe things are just a little bit better, but still during the episode they wanted to make large portions of the New Republic seem really shady. We're not torturing you, this is totally different. The dosage is so much lower, but yes, it is kind of like torture. The speeder that he rides in across the city is meant to seem similar to the yellow one that Anakin and Obi-Wan had during Attack of the Clones. When the droid references the Mantabog of Malastair, that's an airborne blanket-shaped predator that smothered its prey. It's referenced during the Star Wars role-playing game. There are a lot of deep cut references like that during the episode. It's also meant to be a sly wink at the idea of the Mythosaur, which they previously believed to be extinct, which we know is still alive. When he goes back to the Amnesty housing projects where they're putting him up now, the other former Imperials use the slang word poodoo, which is from the prequels. It's just another Star Wars word for poop. And they genuinely seem like a pretty decent bunch, with one exception. They share a drink, they joke about how things are really no different under the New Republic, like, yay, we're glad the Empire's gone, but really, it's not that different. He does seem kind of antsy about associating with former Imperials, like he genuinely did not like working for the Empire and doesn't want to have anything to do with them. And we find out the former comms officer also lives here and is there basically to try and eventually lead him to the Star Destroyer to get him arrested. I'll explain that in a second too, but everything she was doing in the episode was to further the goal of getting him arrested. The other joke here about the number designations, all their names, is that the Empire used to do that to dehumanize them like all stormtroopers just went by their number designations. They didn't actually have real names. It's just another way to show you that things are no different under the New Republic. It's also meant to feel very dehumanizing, like a lot of Dr. Pershing's actually daily work. It's meant to give you a lot of vibes for the Cyril Karn character during the Andor series. Most underappreciated genius living in the New Republic currently. Later in the episode, we find out her name is really Elia Kane, which I think is her being honest. They didn't give her a name in previous seasons, so this is like a brand new thing for this season. It's a bit of a retcon. And she references that they both used to work for Moff Gideon. The other former Imperials also make it sound like everyone believes that he escaped en route to a New Republic war tribunal and they don't know where he is. Like nobody in the public knows where he is, but secretly they imply that the New Republic may have just taken him to conditioning to a mind flayer to pull more information out of his brain. Like they do at the end of the episode. I think the end of the episode also kind of confirms something similar happened to Moff Gideon. And I think that's why Elia Kane, the comms officer, is doing what she's doing in the episode. The mind flare that they reference is a callback to Rogue One, which is a creature that just literally rips information out of people's brains. When Pershing claims that he misses the ration biscuits that the Empire used to hand out in the Outer Rim, later they pay that off when Elia Kane gives him a bunch. She also references the core worlds, that's where Coruscant is. It's where the old power of the galaxy resides, like the oldest, wealthiest planets, basically. Later in his apartment, we get all kinds of facts about Coruscant, talking about the world as an ecumenopolis. 
That literally just means a city encompassing the entire planet. If you didn't realize that Coruscant is a city-wide planet, it's meant to be many, many thousands of years old, like it's been many, many thousands of years since you could actually see the planet's surface. They get into this during the Clone Wars too. What happens is, is that over the thousands of years, when they want to build more city, they'll just build another layer on top of the old city, so it just keeps building up and up and up and up. And all the lower levels is where all the criminal activity happens, like all the really shady stuff. There was a scene during Andor where Luthen actually goes down to the lower levels to conduct some shady business with one of his informants. And it probably wound up being one of the greatest speeches in all of Star Wars too. That was a great episode of Andor. When the recording starts talking about Coruscant as the center of the galaxy is more of a metaphor, that's the idea because it used to be the capital, it's not the physical center of the galaxy. The planet that is closest to the actual physical center of the galaxy is Bis, which used to be one of the Emperor's home bases, especially in Legends canon. It's a planet that's bathed in the dark side of the Force, like very powerful in the dark side. The reason why I think they made that reference specifically is because during the Dark Empire storyline, Biss is where the Emperor kept all of his clones, and Dr. Pershing's whole storyline is about cloning Force-sensitive beings. It'd be really cool if they brought some of that stuff from Dark Empire back into the canon. Like I said earlier, the cubicle that they have him working in his day job is meant to give you a lot of vibes for Cyril Karn during Andor. Same basic principle, just wasting away at the most boring job ever, archiving information, all former Imperial technology, really useful stuff that's being scrapped, that they're basically throwing away. When his co-worker references Bendu Day, Bendu was a creature from Star Wars Rebels. He lived on the planet Adalon and claimed to represent the center of the Force between the light side and the dark side and gave Kanan and Ezra Bridger lessons in the true nature of the Force. He was also voiced by probably the most famous Doctor Who from Classic Who, Tom Baker. Another Grand Admiral Thrawn Easter egg, Grand Admiral Thrawn wound up facing the Bendu eventually. The Bendu even saw a vision of Thrawn's future and told him. But the whole idea is the Bendu was meant to be much more powerful than a traditional Jedi or Sith because he wielded both the dark and the light. Which I think they'll get into with Grogu's storyline. Like the whole idea is that he won't follow the traditional Jedi path like he left Luke Skywalker's Jedi Academy and he will seek his own path through the Force kind of like Ahsoka is doing. And he'll wind up wielding the Force in a more complete way, like a more holistic way than the Jedi or the Sith did in the past. The other big Bendu easter egg too is that the Bendu was originally the name that George Lucas wanted to use for the Jedi. Later he changed the name to Jedi in the script for A New Hope. You notice they use another R5 droid that's delivering him more archive information to be destroyed. He goes on the tour of the city that Elia Kane offered him and they list off a whole bunch more facts about the actual city itself. Like it's a bit of a tour guide for the city like did you know that over a trillion people live on this planet? She claims that she went to the Imperial Academy on Coruscant and she's coming back, but it feels different because it feels much less hopeful. The whole idea here is that she's trying to drop him hints that, oh no, no, I hate the New Republic, I'm still sympathetic to the Empire. You kind of get that vibe from her, like she definitely feels kind of shady and tries to get him to admit to feeling underappreciated. Think about how many people your work could help. Then when they see Coruscant's version of Mount Everest sticking out from the planet like a monument, I think this is meant to be the first time we've actually seen a physical piece of the Coruscant planet. Every time you see it in the Clone Wars, during Star Wars Rebels, during the other movies, you're only just seeing the actual city that was built on top of the planet. So the tip of the mountain here that he almost touches is meant to be a metaphor for himself, like it's meant to feel insignificant now in this giant cityscape of Coruscant, what it's become in present day. He feels so insignificant in this giant new republic when he has all these great things he could be doing. Both of the scenes with the rehab droid, this one and the one later in the episode, gave me Blade Runner vibes. When it referenced the Coruscant Accords, those were also written after the end of Return of the Jedi when the Empire was defeated and the new republic evolved out of the rebellion. The next morning at his job, he starts asking about the stuff that's getting junk, like all oh, this is good technology, we could just repurpose this, I could show them how to use it. He finally gets so upset that he finally agrees with Elia Kane to go find his lab equipment inside a Star Destroyer. The other interesting thing here too that we find out is that the person says that they're also scrapping, they're junking the former old Rebellion fleet, like they're getting rid of all those capital ships you saw during the original trilogy. All that stuff seems really useful, so it's like the New Republic is getting rid of all the old stuff, even the old rebel stuff. Like why are you throwing away all this good stuff? We could use this for so many things. You also notice when he starts eating the biscuit rations again, they have the Imperial insignia on them. And his nervous tick comes back the second time he visits the rehab droid. Like, okay, finally, now is enough. The funny thing about him reassuring himself of what he's doing in the mirror is the whole idea behind misguided scientists like this is it all meets the same end. Like, they all have to talk themselves into it. Like, I'm doing this for a good reason, this thing that's kind of shady. 
fundamentally he's meant to be a tragic character like he wants to do good but he has trouble bringing himself to do that just because he's so focused on his goal of science he's not really thinking about the bigger picture someone's definitely going to use your cloning research for something really shady eventually then when he finally agrees to go with her they go through the station the guards looking at him funny are doing so because she already tipped them all off they're all just waiting for it to happen so they can arrest him when she mentions Tong's Days, Tong's Day was meant to be the third day of the week, Wednesday, which is the day that they air new Mandalorian episodes. Within the Star Wars universe though, the day is named for Tong's, which is a species that was native to Coruscant. There were more facts about Coruscant in this episode than I think we've gotten in any of the Star Wars movies before. It was kind of like a quick tour guide of the city where you get a quick history of the planet as well. They jump off the back of the train to avoid the ticket droid, no tickets, bit of an Indiana Jones Easter egg there. We have Indiana Jones 5 that's coming out later this year too, it's also Lucasfilm like Star Wars. And they wind up at the scrapyards where they're decommissioning all the old Imperial Star Destroyers that they were able to capture. The last big battle that the Rebels fought against the Empire was at Jakku, and most of the Imperial fleet that survived was actually hijacked by one of the other officers and taken to the Unknown Regions to become the First Order, so the Rebels only gained control of a portion of the old Imperial fleet, not the entire fleet. Also, there's the idea that Thrawn has the seventh fleet, it's completely intact, it's a whole separate thing. So there's still a lot of Imperial capital ships of Star Destroyers that are active out there. But the lab equipment that they go to find inside the Star Destroyer is something that you would find in any Star Destroyer. Like it wasn't his specific lab equipment, it was just random lab equipment. And the whole joke here is that it's all perfectly working, like everything in the lab still has power, it all looks really expensive and really useful, and they're just going to junk it. She continues to butter him up, bit of a honeypot situation here. She also reveals her real name is Aliyah Kane. That might be an Easter egg for Tom Kane, who was one of the voices on Star Wars The Clone Wars. Dave Filoni may have given her the Kane name in honor of him. Dr. Pershing reveals that his real name is Penn Pershing. Then the New Republic guards show up to arrest him, and she shows her hand, like, up. Oh, sorry, sorry about this, but I kind of led you along. And you notice another big easter egg here for previously on the Mandalorian and for the Clone Wars is that Matt Lanter's character comes back. This is meant to be Matt Lanter playing the same character that he did during the Mandalorian season one. The same New Republic officer who used to work on the prison ship. His character didn't have a name during season one but he's meant to be the same person as he was before. He was the voice of Anakin Skywalker more famously during the Clone Wars. They have stealth cameo scenes like this all the time in all kinds of Star Wars episodes, movies all over the place. Mark Hamill has said that he's done it many, many times. I've talked about some of his stealth cameos in my previous episode videos. And usually when they do that, their cameos will go uncredited, so you'll only know if you recognize them or if you recognize their voice. Or if they tell you after the fact. Sam Witwer did the same thing during Star Wars Andor, where he's like, yep, I was that Imperial Guard there, that was me, but he wasn't anywhere in the credits. When he gets arrested, they take him to the reconditioning center that they referenced earlier and they use a mind flayer like device, a torture like device on him to get him to forget. Now the way the Mon Calamari talks about it, they tune the dosage way down, but it's meant to work like the mind flayer did during Rogue One and they can use it in addition to pulling information out of people, they can use it to make people forget things too. He claims it's very pleasant now, they turned the dosage way down and it's not going to be that big a deal. But when Elia Kane's co-worker takes off, she cranks the dial way, way up so it's way more painful and he starts forgetting way more things. I think this is all part of her long plan to break Moff Gideon out of prison and what she's doing here is she's trying to make him forget about everything that they talked about together going back days and days and days so that when he comes out he'll just forget that they ever met. And her grand plan is to advance her career by throwing him under the bus so that she'll get promotions and will allow her to get closer to where they're holding Moff Gideon secretly in a similar type of facility and she'll be able to break him out of prison. Because right after this she takes a bite out of the biscuit just letting you know that she has definitely not switched sides, she is definitely still hardcore empire. So I think she's going to be Moff Gideon's escape ticket because Giancarlo Esposito said that Moff Gideon has a huge rally this season and I think she is the path to that. Feel kind of bad for Dr. Pershing now, even though he probably did some really shady stuff when he was working in the Empire at Mount Tantus. Then we jump back to Mando and Bo-Katan, who's taken her to his covert, reminding her to keep her helmet on for etiquette. They're met by the heavy infantryman Paz Vizsla, which is meant to be a huge reference back to the Clone Wars. Maybe she knew him when they were both part of the Death Watch, but the bigger Easter egg here is that Pre Vizsla used to be her commander and she followed him in Death Watch, and he's either Paz Vizsla's father or his relative or somehow they're related. 
So there is a connection there. Like they might have been part of Death Watch together under Pre Vizsla, but they're both characters that were voiced by John Favreau. So Katie Sackhoff is having another scene with another Vizsla character voiced by John Favreau. He identifies her as a night owl because of the markings on her helmet. Those were the markings on all the banners in her throne room. She had those back during the Clone Wars episodes too. The Night Owls originally started as a hardcore group of female fighters. When she joined the Death Watch Mandalorians in Pre Vizsla, they joined with her. When she left, they left with her too. When he calls her an apostate, her house has fallen. She bathed in the living waters again too, so she was rebaptized, redeemed, just like Din Djarin, which the armor later recognizes. So the joke is that she's not an apostate anymore. And when the armorer recognizes that she was redeemed, she also invites her to join their covert, become part of their clan, as long as she keeps her helmet on. Katie Sackhoff also talked about this too. The whole idea is that Bo-Katan had basically been alone on her home planet there on Kalevala. She lost her family, so to speak. The other night owls took off when she came back without the Darksaber. And now because of what's happened recently, she's starting to believe again, and she just gained another family, the thing that she's wanted. For those of you that are wondering now if Bo-Katan is going to get together with Mando and be like Space Mom and Space Dad to Grogu, technically she's not allowed to take her helmet off right now and neither does Din Djarin. Like he's like, oh no, I'm a Mandalorian again. I'm never taking my helmet off again. By their customs, married couples, like as part of their covert, can take their helmets off when they're alone together. Like when they're getting it on, they can take their helmets off, but only if they become a married couple. I do think though, eventually, at some point in the Mandalorian, we will see the armor take her helmet off though. I think that's the other side of this coin too. Like Bo-Katan has been rebaptized. She is converted, so to speak, like the title of the episode, The Convert. But the flip side of that is that the armor will also chill out just a little bit over the future of the series and eventually she'll take her helmet off too. You also notice that the armor knows exactly who Bo-Katan is without her having to introduce herself, unlike the Paz Vizsla character. Like, oh, I know exactly who you are. There are a lot of people that are now wondering if the armor is secretly Bo-Katan's sister or related to her in some way. There was a mystery third sister that Bo-Katan and Satine had because Corky was their nephew. That means there had to be another sister. I don't know necessarily that Dave Filoni would take this route, but they could say that the armor is that mystery third sister without having to bend over backwards too much. But even if they are not related, I think the armor and Bo-Katan will have some other history that we'll learn about eventually. So the big takeaway from the episode is that there is a mystery Imperial force out there. Like I said, it's probably Thrawn's fleet, the seventh fleet. Eli Kane, the former comms officer, seems like she's en route trying to break Moff Gideon out of prison, slowly working her way closer to him. And now Mando and Bo-Katan's main mission is to rally more Mandalorians to their cause. Go find the other Mandalorians, the Night Owls that left Bo-Katan that deserted her after she came back without the Darksaber. Like, no, no, we have it now. We're rebaptized. We follow the way. It was a great episode. If you spotted any other Easter eggs or references that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. My season three, episode four trailer video will post tomorrow and my full episode four video will post next week after they release it. Everyone click here for that episode four video. I'll update the link as soon as I post that and click here to learn what's going on with Grand Admiral Thrawn and what happened to him after Star Wars Rebels. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and this is the way.